Next up, we have John Lucas uh, presenting the state of NASA operational simulator for small sets. Thank you for the introduction. Mic check, I'm not too loud. Awesome. Well, my name is John Lucas. I work at NASA IVNV. I'm going to go into a little bit more detail about what we are and what we do here uh, at NASA IVNV as well as on the JSTAR team at that facility. Uh, we'll go through some of that background. We'll talk about our first mission, STF-1, uh, and then we'll really get into the state of NOS-3, which is what this talks about, and the path forward there. A little bit about NASA IVNV. It's been renamed to the Katherine Johnson IVV facility. That is independent verification and validation. We actually sit outside of the traditional NASA processes and are an independent organization providing feedback to systems and software on just how they are doing, the risks they're taking, and uh, how the software is really progressing throughout the lifetime of the mission. Uh, we've been around for a while now. Um, we are involved basically for major missions at NASA uh, throughout the entire mission life cycle. So we're helping to write and verify requirements initially and then validate those through our flight software tools and things like that throughout the rest of the design process. Our team at NASA IVNV, the John McBride Software Test and Research Team, or JSTAR, um, was named after Captain John McBride. We figured if you're going to start a lab naming after an astronaut, they can't cancel you then. Our lab has traditionally been doing what we now call digital twins, uh, basically simulation and emulation platforms. Uh, we started building these ourselves, and then as the vendors started providing them, we started just simply acquiring them uh, and combining them, as you saw in some of the talks earlier this morning with Aristotle that Steve gave. Uh, through these, we're actually able to provide IVNV with a unique, unique capability called the independent test capability that we have there, really just enabling them to have a software-only environment. Uh, we are just a small satellite center of NASA with only like 250 employees, right? So we can't afford these million-dollar test beds. So this really enables us to not only, when we can, leverage the remote facilities, but also to do our own test and prep work before we go out and actually run on these large systems in a software-only environment. So as Steve mentioned earlier, our goal really is to condense everything so that it runs on a laptop, just because that's easier for somebody to carry around. And now we're looking more at cloud-based solutions. Uh, we still tend to lean towards laptops, just because everybody has one, uh, and they are a dime a dozen, uh, at least through the government still. All of the flight computer hardware is totally emulated. Uh, we're actually running those binaries as they are delivered and actually deployed to the satellites themselves. Uh, we have all the sensors and actuators simulated. That comes primarily from the missions themselves as they're doing their own development and hi-fi simulations. We're able to integrate those and provide any kind of translations between the actual simulation environment to actual bits and bytes that your hardware really speaks um, so that it can communicate and flight software is none the wiser throughout the entire system. And then your ground software is operated and just deployed as is. That is typically the driving environment on what your overall mission architecture is going to look like in one of our developed uh, digital twins. Our team has really just kind of turned into NASA's digital twin factory. Um, we talked about Aristotle earlier this morning, but pretty much every NASA mission that is Class A, i.e. very expensive or very long running, uh, now has a digital twin that we either maintain, provided by, from the vendor, or we developed ourselves. Uh, we're still looking forward in the future, getting things like Gateway running. Uh, we're still working on Psyche and Europa, and uh, James Webb Sim has even been pulled out again recently uh, just for some fun. Through this, basically, we decided about halfway through that portfolio on the previous slide, we wanted to see how this can actually benefit other missions. Uh, this whole lab that we have is all based out of NASA IVNV and was being used for independent tests, but we decided that we think the developers can really benefit from this kind of capability. And through that, we kind of landed on establishing our own small satellite called STF-1. I ended up being West Virginia's first satellite. We partnered with WVU, a local university in West Virginia, um, and really just built and developed an entire simulation platform that was entirely open source. Uh, the benefit of that being that the entire space community can benefit. We can get new users into space and actually develop more of a pipeline, at least, into the space sector so that people can experience flight software and continue to develop with it. STF-1 then resulted really in NOS cubed originally. It just started as a basic framework. 
um, and now has been expanded to be an entire design reference mission. What this really looks like, if you'd clone this from GitHub and then stand it up, which isn't a fast process, my apologies, um, is basically a virtual machine that's going to have a bunch of different individual pieces in it. Um, we're working to simplify this, but at the highest level, you really have your hardware models there in the top left. That has all of your middleware and glue and all of your sensors and actuators that you would have on, this, on the system itself. We're talking cameras, star trackers, GPSs, gyros, the whole gambit of everything you could have uh, to be able to turn on and off. You also have your flight software. Um, CFS is running there in the middle. And then you have time synchronization, which is critical really to keep everything in lockstep across your entire system. You don't want time to continue on your GPS, for example, if flight software is paused. You've got your traditional ground software there, and then you also have the dynamics. Like I said, just traditionally written by the mission themselves uh, in their HiFi simulations. Um, but here for NOS Cube in the open source realm, we're really just using NASA Goddard's 42, uh, which has seen a number of serious improvements recently for the Roman Space Telescope anyway. So what does this look like really if you step back again? NOS Cubed is just a combination of a multiple pieces of open source software. So I really got to thank the open source community and you all for making all of those available to be combined. Uh, it's really a deployment of CFS and all of these tools. Uh, so thank you all for that. It just gives you a virtual spacecraft that you can poke and prod at, learn on, do research, and even hopefully baseline as your own as you're really developing your own mission moving forward. Uh, it does get complicated, however. You still have all the traditional avenues that you have to deal with on a flight project. You've got flight software, ground software, the dynamics and simulation behind everything, and then you've got all of the middleware to make sure all of those things stay in sync, talk appropriately, and don't actually violate anything that they need to stay containerized in. Our hardware library is kind of enabling NOS 3 behind the scenes. A lot of our major mission architectures from JSTAR are doing processor emulation through Kimu or Simix tools. NOS Cubed, however, since it's just open source, is basically bypassing that and just doing a simple cross compile so you're easily building for either your actual flight software target or you're building for your sim environment. And it's just a simple compi compilation flag uh, to go between the two. NOS Cubed has moved on basically from just being a bare bones model. Nobody wanted actual simulation to flight one code, and they wouldn't let us even release that. So it was just totally bare bones initially when it came out. Um, but through uh, government sponsorship, effectively, we were able to get this up to a design reference mission, um, basically through the development of a various series of missions uh, out of NASA Goddard. Uh, we still maintain a lot of the legacy code that we developed for specific uh, COTS components. However, as the government, we're not allowed to just release that Unfortunately, I've been still working with the lawyers, and it was easier basically to just develop our own generic implementations of these so that universities and folks can download them freely without having to go through any licensing processes. Through this, effectively, we've established a baseline. We've got a set of templating tools that you can basically just copy. If you have a reaction wheel, you can copy the generic reaction wheel that's online rerun the template code, rename it to what you need it to be. For example, if you're going from a cube space wheel to a Sinclair reaction wheel, and then edit the code specifically to actually interface with that device. Uh, we'll already have basically all the links there so you can talk to the Dynamics backend and actually run everything. Uh, not only that, but you actually get an entire um, component workflow basically here. That you're able to review your ICD and actually start getting up and running with flight software development prior to physically having the device in your lab. So the second you get an ICD, you can actually begin flight software development, which is huge, huge, especially due to all the COVID back orders that we're still experiencing. Completed so far, we basically got containerization down now. Uh, effectively, everything was being built locally in a VM, so you had to download an entire virtual machine, deploy it on your laptop, but now all you have to do is download the slightly smaller Docker containers that we have uh, to actually get things up and running. Uh, there's a number of helper scripts that are there that are being improved upon, uh, so please let us know if you have any feedback there as you go forward. Through this process, we're also able to update all of the underlying components. Uh, all of these individual open source tools continue to be iterated upon, CFS uh, and 42 especially, uh, not to mention OpenC3 Cosmos and the other ground station softwares that we support. 
Through this, basically, we were able to expand to a generic ADCS system. We've got all of the actual components and actuators of your spacecraft now simulated uh, with flight software and simulations running side by side. Now we can actually do some sensor fusion and perform generic ADCS utilizing these. So we're able now to put everything together and actually command the spacecraft into modes like BDOT or SunSafe mode uh, in a closed loop scenario to prove that yes, the flight software, the sim, everything is working cohesively and you can actually see the spacecraft point at the sun. Another effort that we've achieved recently is CryptoLib integration. This is effectively a software only solution uh, for your spacecraft to get compliant with NASA standard 1006A. Uh, this is also an open source solution. Effectively, it works on both your spacecraft on and in front of your ground station software, so you can easily integrate it into whatever uh, ground software that you would like. Uh, we partnered with NASA JPL, and they developed the KMC uh, tool suite for the ground uh, in front of their AMOS system. Uh, if you're interested in that, please let me know. We've also developed uh, basically some tool chains and some configuration management to support multiple spacecraft. This is really where we're moving forward with NOS Cubed, is just supporting a number of spacecraft, one to N number, uh, as constellations really become the future of what we're driving forward here. Additionally, we've got efforts like Synopsys, which are really um, big on the collect some, uh, or collect much, return the best data, as we've been talking about here. You'll see that NOS Cubed here really just enables platforms to really develop and expose and get that amount of data that they really need to train your models and then actually deploy them on orbit. Currently now we're working towards basically reducing the configuration overhead that we have in NOS Cubed. Uh, you basically have to be an expert in three or four different systems as well as the mission that you're actually trying to deploy now, and that's a real issue. Um, people don't traditionally get trained for flight software and ground software and mission operations, for example. And so tools like Igniter here will just enable you to focus on your specific development and really configure everything to your specific mission needs as opposed to having everything turned on all the time. Through this, we're also hopeful to get a system test framework set up in NOS Cube and totally open source uh, so that we can actually get CI, CD running on a nightly basis. Another effort here is the on-air, the onboard artificial intelligence and research platform that we've integrated in NOS Cubed. Uh, this platform really is already open source, uh, but it is running in Python, so we're integrating it now in a NOS Cube so that we can have a fully, fully com uh, complete, basically, mission simulation environment for them to collect, the, collect data on and do fault detection and correction in. Last but not least here, we've got F-Prime. We're basically upgrading from CFS into F-Prime here now. We're gonna support both op options here moving forward, but are including F-Prime as an option for flight software uh, in this closed loop NOS Cube environment. Here before I end, I really just wanna hit back on the benefits. Um, the disciplines here that can benefit are broad. It's effectively every organization or every developer across the entire mission lifecycle that can benefit from something like NOS Cubed, your developers, all the way through your IV and V personnel. Um, some of the biggest things we've seen in NOS Cubed are really new personnel uh, and researchers or those doing exploratory testing. Uh, you can't break anything in NOS Cubed, which is great, like you can in the lab. Uh, so really you can just pick it up, see what happens, uh, and then go from there as you do your testing. This also just improves your traditional software development cycles, moving everything forward in your, in your timetable, uh, and really increasing the amount of resources you have to test with. Moving forward here, we're looking to deploy to the cloud through the MCP or the Mission Cloud Platform that NASA Goddard provides. Um, we're working on a proof of concept deployment for a distributed system mission uh, with NASA Goddard. And then we're also looking to expand our toolkit, basically, to include some tutorials uh, and example code, example missions, real missions, as opposed to just something generic like it is now. Um, we're really looking and hopeful for more community requests from coming here today, so please get on the GitHub and just feel free to submit any suggestions, ideas, or improvements that you guys might have. Uh, with that, that's my conclusion. So thank you all for all of your support and making everything open source the app so far. Just keep trying to make that happen. So thank you.
question? Question. I have a couple of them online. Uh, first one, it says, how do you coordinate and facilitate collaboration in flight development across NASA centers, IVMB, JPL, JSC, and so forth? That is very difficult. Traditionally, IVNV actually has a point of contact on both sides. Uh, IVNV will have a primary point of contact at our facility and then the actual mission development facility, and we'll have them interface face-to-face -face, uh, basically quarterly, if not more often than that, as well as just support any kind of collaboration as needed through teams and other tools traditionally. As it goes from mission... As it goes from center to center, it gets a little bit more difficult since they're all competing, um, but that's something we just try and keep in check. Thank you. Thank you. Another one, uh, why was 42 chosen instead of TRIC for NOS 3? Uh, 42 was actually just chosen because it was a NASA Goddard project. IBNV is managerially under NASA Goddard, so NASA Goddard has all of our admin and things like that and is the closest center to NASA IVNV, and so that was just chosen originally through them since we had direct access to the Eric Stone King, the developer. Do we have time for one? Yeah. Um, so you mentioned that you do some cross compilation and maybe some QEMU for uh, things that are dependent on different architectures, but what about things that depend on certain hardware like a microcontroller and expect to run on that? How could that run in a simulation environment? So the simulators themselves, you can basically pick your level of fidelity, which is always interesting and kind of a difficult problem when you're doing simulations. Um, traditionally, in NOS Cube, we really look at the component level. So think physical things on your spacecraft, whether that be a gyro or the actual instrument itself. Uh, but you can go down all the way as deep as you need to to actually get the level of fidelity you want for your test. Uh, if that's registers in your actual FPGA space or modeling the entire microcontroller and having a little Kimu instance embedded in your simulator, that's something that's possible. But finding that balance is always the tricky part on how much time do I want to develop the sim and getting the product done. Any more questions? I have one more question online. We can uh, take that. How difficult is it to plug in a custom flight software or sim framework or solution? Flight software is a little bit more difficult than we would like. A lot of that just comes from being able to tie in time uh, and time control. Depending on what architecture you're trying to integrate, they might not have thought of actual time uh, in the traditional sense that sims would drive or they would have an external time driver controlling that. So that always gets interesting. Um, we're working that now with F Prime. If anybody wants to follow along, everything's being worked in the open and in the issue. Um, and I think they're actually posting weekly or bi-weekly is your status report. So you can see that live, what's going on there. One more? Yeah, okay. Let's go. Hi. Do you think uh, you may support a sort of a fault injection system in the future? I mean, in the models or in the whole system? Absolutely, yeah. We actually do have uh, some terminal or simulator backdoors that do exist already in the architecture. Uh, but we're lo looking to expand that to a system-level framework, so you don't actually have to manually type in uh, the faults that you want to inject to your simulation as it's going live. That is something we hope to do in the very near term. Thank you, John. Well, thank you all.